Okay, so welcome to my presentation about digital preservation or with another name, uh, long-term archiving and research data. Um, it's, it's going to be a general um, presentation about digital preservation, but um, some challenges are in uh, context of research data even more challenging. So I will um, point that out when we come to that. And I also added um, one of the digital preservation icons here. You, you can see the hands and the numbers. And um, this is to signify um, there's a technical aspect to digital preservation, but also a human aspect. OK, so what is digital preservation? Um, it can have many, many names, as you've seen from the, um, the title already. Um, I know that archiving gives you an immediate association, but um, the community actually calls itself um, digital preservation, which you can also see from the two initiatives over here, which are pretty uh, well known in the community. Um, it can have also many meanings. Um, we have uh, standards and best practices, but um, how far an institution implements them depends um, also on the institution, its resources, and so on. So um, in general, well, we want to preserve digital objects, of course. Um, and if you do this on a very high level, um, you can align with the reusability of the FAIR data principles. Um, but it's not a guarantee of usability. It's a definition of responsibilities and development of strategies because we don't know what the future holds. And we're going to do our best, but we can't guarantee that you're going to be uh, able to reuse this object in 50 or 100 years. So since um, we don't know what the future holds, um, we're kind of extrapolating also from um, experiences where we lost um, content, digital content, um, and the um, respective risks. So you might already know um, from personal experience um, the case that you wanted to open a file, there's something technically wrong with this file, and you get an error message. Or you want to use um, some kind of file or um, animation. In this case, um, I added the um, flash player icon. Um, and it's, it was in, discontinued by uh, Adobe at the beginning of uh, trend, um, last year. So um, this, there's a case that um, files can become obsolete and then you don't have the um, software anymore to open them. And there are also different and additional um, risks to digital content, like um, the researchers here on the upper left corner uh, looked at databases in biology after 18 years and the ma majority of them were labeled dead. That is um, the content, the, the um, data in this databases uh, was not accessible and not reusable anymore. Or the case um, in the upper right corner, the moon landing, the um, original high resolution tapes were actually lost because probably um, they were overwritten or the, the content on these tapes was, was overwritten as part of the normal reusable yeah, reuse workflow of these tapes. Um, and in the lower left corner, you have the missing metadata. In some cases, you can read um, the information in the file, but you don't know what it means. So the researcher cannot reuse it. And you have this case in data creation and um, research data management, also as a topic. OK, and then we can. Um, align these risks with aims of digital preservation. Um, so um, we have for all standards, there are also different and additional standards, but in this standard we have uh, three levels and we like to use this, um, this standard because um, it's easy to understand and um, can help you kind of classifying what you can um, provide. 
Um, so in this standard, we have um, the lowest level, which is um, the more technical levels. This is bitstream preservation. And um, with this, we want to um, preserve the data integrity on the bitstream level and physical preservation in case of um, storage media. And we want to preserve, prevent this risk of um, opening a file and you get an error message. In this case, we use um, checksum routines. A checksum is a um, combination of letters and numbers um, for a file. And if the file changes in any way, the checksum changes as well. Um, and additionally, um, we're, going to, we're using redundant storage. And if you um, notice a, cha a changed checksum and the copy was not supposed to be changed, you can get um, an intact copy from the redundant second storage, or you have to repair the object. Um, then there's a second level, um, which is where we are working mostly on. So this is um, uh, addressing the risk that a file format um, is becoming obsolete. Um, and it wants to preserve the authenticity of the object and the technical reusability. That means you can open the object um, and you can render the content and read the content. Um, if uh, a format is going to be obsolete, we use migration to a new format for these objects. Or if you have a software, for example, you might need to emulate the um, software environment. And because um, migration may basically is very format specific, um, we um, need to do format characterization for this. So, um, I'm going to talk about this more later. And then um, we have the highest level, which is, um, you know, the aim is um, preserving intellectual ability. Um, this is the R from the fair data principles and findability, which is the app. And um, we're doing this by preserving descriptive metadata and context information um, alongside the ob objects. Okay, and then this sounded a lot like what um, research data management also is doing, but um, what we are taking into account is um, that we are preserving the objects for a designated community. And um, a small section is the community as it is now, but we want to preserve um, these objects into an indeterminate, indeterminate future. That means we are also taking into account that um, they optimally should be reusable 50 years, 100 years into the future. And um, the possible needs of a digit, uh, designated community <clears throat> in this future are also considered. Okay, and I had two, um, two other risks, which is um, the loss of the data in these databases and the uh, moon landing tapes. And this is um, an issue related to management. So you have to define clear responsibilities, who is responsible for preservation of what, for how long, why, um, where's the funding coming, of, coming from, and so on. This is also part of digital preservation. And therefore, it makes sense to uh, write a preservation community, a uh, preservation policy, which um, uh, yeah, contains this information and is also published. Um, in case of that we met, um, we have the institutional strategy and um, certain legal imperative um, saying that we um, ha have a responsibility um, preserving um, publications. Um, we have a designated community that are the life sciences. Um, we know what we want to preserve because that we met has, has its own holding and this is more or less defined also by the acquisition profile. And then you also um, have to take into account that um, your resources are limited. Therefore, it makes sense to include corporations into um, your digital preservation strategy. And um, we are also doing this in regard to um, 
the technical level. There we have um, a consortia with um, ZBW and TBW, ZBW and TIB. Um, we have a joint system, preservation system with um, the software Rosetta um, and the servers and the maintenance of the servers are um, at TEB. Then we also need to recognize if there's some um, format that is soon obsolete. And this information we exchange with the digital preservation community that is also called Technology Watch. And any kind of technical and format specific and emulation specific um, uh, information. This is all um, information that um, is part of yeah, the exchange of um, knowledge with the digital preservation community. And then of course, um, when we want to preserve usability, we also have to stay in contact with the research communities, um, life sciences in this case, and um, data providers in case we want to give data back to our providers. Okay, and um, we have this little, um, person over there with us that we made icon um, because we are doing all of these three levels. These are um, responsibilities that we made um, defined in the preservation um, policy. Okay, and so the setup um, it looks a bit crowded, but I'm going to explain. So we get the data uh, from data providers that could be a pro um, publication platform. Um, we also have a external provider, which is a pilot project at the moment. Um, we're getting da data and metadata. Um, and then we have our own submission application um, here at ZBNet, which is collecting the data and preparing a data pa package. And then the data package can be um, uploaded um, and we call it ingest, ingested into um, Rosetta. Um, and in case our data provider, for example, the publication platform is losing some kind of data, they can tell us where well, we need um, this data again, please um, export this. And um, in this case, we can provide the data package um, or packages. Um, you might notice that there's no direct interaction with um, users. Um, the designated community is um, added here because we have some kind of information and knowledge exchange, but we are a dark archive. Um, that means um, <clears throat> uh, users cannot directly access um, the content inside our archive. This is also a security um, measure. Okay, and um, I also added ZBW and TRB um, down here because they provide um, the server and the um, IT infrastructure. <clears throat> but every one of us has their own um, data space. So we, um, we can configure um, Rosetta and um, add our um, objects inside without any of the others accessing our space. Um, and we might notice also two different quality assurance um, steps. Um, I will go into detail um, in the next slide. But um, quality assurance is um, because everything here is more or less automated. It is built into um, Rosetta that there is a certain set which um, is also always checked by a person um, in order to catch any um, uh, yeah, mistakes and difficulties that um, just go through the automated workflow. Um, we also have the risk management and pres the preservation module inside of Rosetta. This is kind of the heart of Rosetta, the preservation um, that is more or less automated, but not um, completely. And um, I will introduce this later on. Um, first with the quality assurance. Um, this is where we um, check the checksums when we get objects. Um, that means if the checksum is not as um, the checksum we generate is not the same as the one we get with the object, something is going wrong, we have to check the object. Um, this is something that is done pretty early because if a few years go by, um, it's difficult to kind of um, 
find the original um, object again and um, maybe get a replacement or something. Um, if, you, if, you, if we don't get checksums, we have to generate this um, new um, and these are stored in the technical metadata. Then we're also checking for the format of um, this file we get. And uh, this is the tool we use, Droid, which um, identifies the format. And we are not using mine types or the ending of a file, but we're using format signatures for that. Um, and the format signatures are um, stored in a um, format registry, which is called Pronom. And I can show you this. Um, in Pronom, you can search for PDF. You have all the different PDF versions. There are a lot, there are four different pages. And if you select one um, version, you get the value, which is a format signature, which is um, yeah, a byte sequence that is specific for this format. If you um, open a file with this format in a hex editor, you get always this value at a specific location in the file. Okay, and um, what we're also checking for is validity um, against the format um, of the file. Um, this is something we can do if um, the format specification has been published and there's a tool that can check whether the file um, conforms to this format specification. People working with XML know that you can check for well formatness and validity. Um, we're using Jove, which can um, validate several different formats, and Vera PDF, which validates um, PDF A version. Um, and if you have another format which is not covered by Jove or Vera PDF, you have to check for tools that um, are able to validate this format. And we have a tool registry which is called Copter, um, also populated by the digital preservation community. Um, <clears throat> so we are also extracting technical metadata during uh, ingest. Um, processes and um, this can, could be, for example, um, if you have a video file, um, you can extract um, the information how long the video is running, the video length. And all of this um, metadata is um, saved with the files and why do we need this? So this is the part where risk management and preservation um, actions and planning comes in. Um, first, we have objects in the, um, in the archive for which we can check the checksums. That is just checking the um, object integrity. If there's something wrong, um, we might have to replace. There should, shouldn't be going anything wrong inside the archive, but you never know. So if there's something wrong, we might need to replace the object, um, or we might need to repair it and repairs here on, on the the lower um, to the third point. Um, for this, we also need tools again. Um, <clears throat> um, these are also probably format specific. Um, now, what our main um, subjective with preservation planning is, is the format at risk in any way. So maybe a format is soon obsolete. Um, we have to select all objects with this format inside the archive. That's the reason we um, uh, identified the formats of the objects. Um, and then we um, try migration tools. And usually you might know, um, for example, <clears throat> um, you're trying to migrate XLSX files into CSV. The content will change. So um, you need first um, the tools, maybe um, for this format, a tool exists, but maybe not. And then you have to do quality, um, quality assurance again. And in order to um, automate this a little bit, we can also reuse the technical metadata. For example, um, with a video file, we can say, okay, the video length should not change, even though I migrated to a new format. 
And that's the reason um, the technical metadata is stored with the files. And um, we also have a knowledge base inside um, of Rosetta, which is um, collecting all these different formats and um, adding or um, allows us to add risks for this format. Um, so um, if, you, if you find something wrong, we have to go, um, if you find as anything wrong doing quality assurance in the ingest or inside the archive, we have to go on a little detective journey sometimes um, because we have to find out well, what is this error message um, that this validation tool, this uh, migration tool is giving us. Um, so this is also a big part of a big part of um, uh, work that digital preservation is doing. Um, okay, and um, I I told you about all these different tools that are format specific, and this is where the difficulty um, regarding um, research data comes in because if you have a super rare format. Um, possibly also um, uh, um, proprietary format. It's unlikely that you have a signature and pronome. Pronome is also, the digital preservation community maintains pronome. So um, it has only uh, format signatures where people had time and um, had enough formats to um, generate or decide on the signature. It's unlikely, uh, rare formats, it's unlikely you have a signature and pronoun. Um, it's unlikely <clears throat> that there's a validation tool. Um, if it's a property format, um, the specification also hasn't been uh, published. So therefore, you cannot have um, an open um, validation tool. Maybe the um, provider of the format and the software um, provides one, but maybe not. And um, it's also unlikely that you have a migration and repair tool. And then something can, like this can happen. So in this case, people had um, old data from 1970 up to the late 1990s. And um, they did not know what kind of format it was. It was obsolete and it was also proprietary and they opened it in a hex editor and it showed something like this. Um, eventually they um, found some uh, one software which was able to render the content, not perfectly, but um, well enough that they were able to recognize what the um, file was supposed to be. But in case you're not able to find a respective um, software that is able to do that, the data is lost. Okay, and um, I talked a lot about the technical metadata and what um, that we are storing them um, to give you a short, more or less short overview into the metadata we are um, preserving. Um, we have the descriptive metadata. Um, this is in a Dublin core format, uh, which is also indexed in Rosetta. And for the um, preservation metadata, we're using premise, or Rosetta is using premise, um, which has um, elements like file format. And then all of this metadata is also structured with a container format, METS. <coughs> uh, METS has originally seven sections. Um, Rosetta is using only four of those. The descriptive metadata section, that is where Dublin core sits. Um, the administrator, administrative metadata section, that is where premise or the version of premise Rosetta uses um, is located with subject sections, technical metadata, rights, source, provenance, and also two other sections which are mostly um, have information about uh, files and structure of files of a um, data set. Um, so this is what um, Rosetta Metz looks like, looks like a little bit. I mentioned the descriptive metadata section and the two sections below, not that important, but the administrative metadata section is um, the important one in this case. Um, and you notice three different levels, another time three different levels, but in this case, um, it's intellectual entity. Um, 
representation and FL for file. So you might have a, a publication, which is an intellectual entity. Um, you might have a publica text publication in PDF and a text publication in XML. And both of these are two different representations. And you might have whether PDF, XML, and also supplemental materials, so um, a few other files, and all of these are part of um, the file section. And then you have the um, subsections in all of these. Um, but what's in interesting is um, the file section where we have the technical metadata, and this is where um, checksums are stored, the file format um, result is stored, validation results um, in their extracted technical metadata in general, which is called significant properties by Rosetta. And um, in the other sections, well, rights has spreads, of course. Source metadata can have all kinds of metadata um, among the creation date of metadata. Um, and the digital provenance uh, section has the validation event. For example, this tool uh, validated this file at this time point. Okay, so everything um, since now was pretty um, file specific, but um, you can also have for digital preservation complex objects, for example, like websites. We're not actually doing um, web archiving, but it has some kind of challenges which are interesting nonetheless. Um, the website is a combination of different objects, HTML, image files, CSS, and so on. And um, digital preservation has a standard, the WAR container, um, the well-known internet archive, which is doing um, web archiving is using the standard. And now you have a container, you have all these different components, but in order to generate, again, an object which is looking more or less like uh, the object it was before, or maybe 50 years ago, you need a viewer. <clears throat> and in this case, it's a browser with a specific version, so software, um, and uh, maybe a specific environment as well. The Internet Archive is using the Wayback Machine. Um, but this challenge to regenerate exactly or more or less exactly the, um, the complex object is also what uh, is an issue in case of software preservation. Um, you can have different kinds of software, commercial, open source, research software, and um, code as data analysis scripts. These could be, um, sometimes these are so similar, sometimes um, they're different, more or less complex. And um, they're all, or most of them depend, yeah, have dependencies. And you can hear in the see in the comic on the right side that you have all modern digital infrastructure and they're depending on all kinds of um, software and um, other uh, infrastructure which has um, been developed before. And um, they are not static. So <laughs> if you're developing your infrastructure, some uh, a project, some random person in Nebraska, Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since um, 2003, is also continuously maintaining um, this kind of part of the infrastructure. So you have all those these dependency, you have the environment, um, operating systems, for example, maybe even the hardware. Um, there are lots of changes because um, whole infrastructure is uh, continuously developed uh, and maintained. Um, and all these components also have rights and licenses, which um, as far as GitHub, um, the licenses are machine readable and pretty um, well used. So I think in that case, it's going into the right direction. But um, the challenge regarding the dependency is still um, yeah, an actual challenge. There are some um, institutions that are also working on standards and solutions. Um, you can see the names here, and the star is the software heritage, um, which was also presented in one of the research lectures. Uh, colloquia. Um, 
And the standards are in general also fair standards, but if you want to think about well, what is digital preservation specific, you can do a thought experiment, which I like to do. What could be relevant when you want to use this software 50 years into the future? And if you're thinking why well, 50 years, um, thinking back, this, this would be from now, 1972, um, when I looked for in, uh, in preparation for this pre um, presentation into Wikipedia, what the operating systems were, um, 1972, I didn't recognize any, but I did recognize two programming languages. So some, some things are consistent and, and a lot of things change. And um, I also like to look into well, um, what are people um, struggling with when they want to um, use old software um, now at the moment. So they usually doing an emulation of the environment for the software. Um, sometimes they have to do data forensics and generally um, they are also doing this um, uh, detective work, trying to find out what this software means, um, what are the components and um, respective dependency. So, and that was it, I'm finished. Mm -hmm.